Hello, humans, and welcome to another episode of Gen X Gamer. Oh, man, I feel great today. The voice is doing fine. Got some treatment, but it only lasts for a little bit. So let's see how far we can go with this one. Um, I was looking at my collection, guys, and I was thinking about the great years in gaming, right? And one of the reasons that we know some of the features in the gaming market today are not great, it's because we had such great content in the past, like 2009. And I was just looking at my collection, you know, and I'm just browsing through it, seeing what I'm going to play. And then I look at this lineup and then I start, you know, just flipping through the titles and I realize these are all from 2009, just about. So check this line out, lineup right here. Batman, Arkham, Asylum, Bayonetta. I know a lot of people are not <laughs> uh, soccer fans out there, but FIFA 10 was a great game. Uh, we had Resident Evil 5, Assassin's Creed 2, Borderlands, Modern Warfare 2, and Halo ODST. And those two last titles really are the ones that got me thinking about this journey. The ODST re reminds me, or the Hell Divers 2, at least when you're dropping, reminds me of, of the Halo game. And the comparisons that were made for Modern Warfare 3 um, and how, you know, it was reskinned in, in a few areas. Uh, really, the criticism was lack of originality. And you take that into consideration with every other problem that you have today in the gaming market whether it's uh, the video games becoming too um, politicized, you know, where people are putting in their own agendas of what, whatever it may be, or uh, games not offering the same quality of content, or the games just not being original. All these criticisms we can trace back to the seventh generation because that's where we knew what gaming started to become, you know, and the possibilities of gaming. If you remember it's the seventh generation, what made it so special is that we were getting graphics to the point where, you know, we started admiring gra graphical quality of games really became uh, features of every console that they wanted to emphasize, right? Um, but also you had great creative writing. And since a lot of these games were, you know, first-person experience, not all of them were online games, developers would put a lot of effort and the budget would go into the creative side of it, whether it was music, whether it was writing, whether it was programming. Uh, you could see the difference. And you can see how the gaming industry has changed today where it's really about the money. Back then, they would chase the money through quality. If I create a quality product, I'm going to sell the most amount of games possible to my audience. That was the goal back then. And today, really everybody's chasing live game services, microtransactions, because whether we like it or not, that's what people are paying the most money for. Most of money for. But... Uh, it's not about all about chasing cash when it comes to quality. Right? You can have a, a great game that makes no money, and you can have a lesser <laughs> a lesser game make a lot more money. Look at Konami. Right? You, you can have Hideo Kojima uh, produce a great game for you, or you can just do a bunch of mediocre games that will almost double the company size on mobile. In the end, these companies are about making money, but this, the experience to us suffers. And I think they could be a great medium, right? There doesn't have to be any fake diversity because fake diversity is like, I don't know, if, if you wanted to change the narrative of Batman, right? And you want to make him, I don't know, make him Mexican. <laughs> that is fake diversity, why not create a new character? Why not create a character that's already existing in, in literature, in Hispanic literature? They're not going to do that. They're not going to spend the money on that. It's just laziness to just reskin a character and change the narrative of the story, thinking that you're going to reach a wider audience, which you're not. All you're doing is alienating your base. 
And the thing is that with microtransactions, the market has already told you that people are willing to spend the money in microtransactions on a game they love. Now imagine being the artist in one of these games where you spend your time and effort creating something new, whether it's visual, whether it's programming, what have you, and you, you produce a gaming experience based on that, which you think is great. And here you come and you present your game and you're in a board meeting and, you know, BlackRock or any of this other investment firms that own about usually about 10 percent of the larger video game companies and say, no, we want it to change the narrative to this. Now you're as an artist, you're compromised because your vision is no longer true. Right. They're forcing you to say this message. Now, this is what you're getting paid for. So there's very little that these artists can do. They're just part of the machine. Right? They're just part of a bigger machine. And they have to comply with orders because if they don't, those investors will threaten to sell the stock and drop the company's market value when they do. They'll just dump it at the cheapest price possible and make these companies pay. And that's why these companies comply with all this forced you know, political points of view or agendas. That's the way that works, unfortunately. And there's very little the actual creators of the games can do once they become part of the, these big conglomerates. But when we look back at this generation and you look at the just the variety of games, the opportunities for creativity, the freedom, right? The freedom that these artists have back in the day um, to create something original and not being afraid of being censored because they didn't have the right point of view on any certain thing of having to insert characters that didn't belong in the story, having to change characters that had already been written, you know, by an outside consulting firm that was being forced upon them because of a company directive, because of investors. It's just a very different dynamic. You know, are we going to see these days again? You know, I hope so. Right. There's always hope. The market always reacts to what people buy. People want to buy those Resident Evils. They want to buy those Modern Warfare 2s. They can settle for other things. But if those companies keep producing the same crap, somebody will come along and give it, the people exactly what they wanted. Look at what Hell Divers is doing right now. Look at what Pal World did. Creating millionaires overnight over games that the original creators of these games could have made. Right? All the ideas are there. Pal World didn't invent anything new. All they did is bring everything that players wanted into the game. If it was a seventh generation, Pokemon would have done that, right? Through market pressure. If it was a seventh generation, other companies would have produced Hell Divers. But what do we have now? We have games that, you know, can be made with hundreds of millions of dollars that produce a very poor experience. And if you spent the same amount of money back in 2009, for the most part, I'm generalizing, of course, but for the most part, if you put those kind of resources in a game of the seventh generation, you would have gotten a lot better results, especially from AAA companies. That no longer holds true. There is a correction in the market right now. I wouldn't say it's a crash. I think it's a correction because you can't spend that much money on a video game and not have it produce a return. You can't spend $300 million and only get a 6% profit like Sony's doing right now. That's not sustainable, guys, because of inflation, because people want higher salaries, because of many other things. Something has to give. You either have to cut the jobs or you have to cut the costs. You can't keep making games like that. It's not going to work. So there is a hope. There is a hope. A game like, like Stellar Blade, for example, where the creator just said, no, I'm making a game that I want to play, that I think my audience wants to play, based on the games that I grew up with. Right? He's an admirer of those type of games when games were not censored, when people didn't have to bend to corporate pressures, when the artist got to be artists, when programmers got to be programmers, when everybody got together to make the best video game possible, and produce a gaming experience, and through that, through that quality of that work, 
they would become millionaires. That always works. Look at Hell Divers. Look at Pal World. It's easy to see for anybody out there. If not, you're going to keep on producing junk <laughs> like the Justice League and like every other failure that's come before it. All right, guys, those are my quick thoughts. I'm going to save my voice here. I have to go back to doing homework, but I will catch you on the next one. Take care.